Corsair's new LL series hydraulic bearing fans feature excellent airflow, quiet operation, and powerful lighting with 16 independent RGB LEDs across two separate loops. Available in 120 and 140 millimeter sizes and controlled by Corsair's Lighting Node Pro, LL series fans can give your system a distinct and customizable look. Click the link in the description for more information. Excellent! Hello everyone! And <coughs> Uh, hey guys, how's it going? And welcome to Probing Paul, episode number 21. This is my monthly q and I am doing the episode for November right now, and if you guys want to look at any of the past Probing Paul episodes that I've done in the past, uh, there they are in my Probing Paul playlist, which is linked in this video's description, and you can check that out. All the questions that I'm going to be answering today, which are some tech-based and some just random questions people wanted to ask me, are taken from last month's episode. So if you want to ask me a question to be answered next month in December, then feel free to leave those comments in the comments section down below. And heck, while you're down there, if you want to hit the thumbs up button, that's always appreciated too. But let us jump right into the questions for this month. And this is actually a follow-up from last month that several people commented on because one of the questions was about Windows 10 activation and KingWin.net and is it still legit and various other sort of sub questions resulting from that. So I gathered a few responses from different commenters about uh, Nicholas C, for example, N Nick Cage, is that you? Can't tell with the sunglasses on. Uh, he contacted Windows customer support. They transferred his license after he showed them proof of pur purchase of his new motherboard and CPU. So the Windows key was an old sticker on his PC, but they attached it to the motherboards and switched it over. So there's an example of uh, Microsoft taking what appears to be an OEM license and the, the, the dude saying, hey, I just bought this new stuff. Can you transfer it over? And Microsoft agreeing to that, which apparently happens, at least according to Nick C, and we, you know, I can't imagine him misleading us. So again, these are the types of things where I would say, hey, go ahead and try this, but unless we have sort of a preponderance of evidence of people saying they were able to do this and it's like Microsoft policy, then your mileage may vary, of course. Uh, Night Raptor said he's used the same key on multiple installs of Windows 7 Ultimate and Windows 10, the same key, and it still works. Night, Rap Night Raptor, I have a difficult time testing that myself because it's kind of case by case and there's lots of different types of Windows keys that come from different locations, but there were some people who followed up and said that it worked the same way for them as well. So definitely if you have an old Windows 7 license, it seems to very much be worth it to just get Windows 10, install it, you can install it without a key, and then just plug the key in and see if it'll activate. And Maybe sometimes it will. And if it doesn't, then maybe contact Microsoft directly and see if you can talk them into activating it for you. Finally, Thomas said, if you connect your Microsoft account to your Windows 10 license, uh, he's asking, can you then use it on two, two separate machines easily? Yes, you can. Um, and it's more of like it's attached to you rather than attached to your hardware. I still personally like uh, registering the key to my hardware rather than my personal license, but that's up to you. And if you are in a situation where you just have a couple systems and you need to say, take uh, a personally activated license on one system and start using it on a new, new system you built or something, that's a viable option as well. Question number two is also a follow-up from last month, and this is a correction on my part because I was talking about one of the earlier, uh, the first dual-core CPU that I got, and I claimed it was the AMD Athlon 3200+, Plus, and several people, Darks, Phil, as well as Lozil, Naranja, and Lord, Lord Luck, and Mocha Less agreed and were disappointed. So sorry, that was totally my bad, and I just wanted to correct here and show you guys the CPU that I actually had because it was an Athlon 64X2 3800+, plus, not 3200+. plus. Here's the CPU world entry for that. It was socket 939 and there was a sort of a crossover period when uh, the Athlon 64X2 started coming out somewhere on 939 and then they moved over to AM2 after that. So this was uh, one of the slightly earlier ones. Price at introduction was $354. It was launched on August 1st, 2005. It had a dual channel memory controller uh, and it had, of course, uh, two cores and two threads right there, as well as 64-bit, as well as being 64-bit. Uh, so lots of AMD innovation back in the mid-2000s on display right there, and thanks for the correction. But let's move on to some real questions for this month, or the first real, this is probably the realest question for this month, by Piotr Nowak. And I believe I've answered one of Piotr's questions before, and he actually asked, I almost, an oops, sorry, I almost answered this last month. Uh, it's about DDR, DDR speeds, memory speeds in general. Comparing, say, DDR1600 cast latency 8 versus DDR2800 cast latency 14. He's talking about the difference between rated speeds for memory and cast latency, or more, more simply put, latency. Uh, if you compare different speed memory, especially if you're comparing DDR4 and DDR3, for example, you might find that they have the same actual response time. Which is better, speed 
or response time, especially if you're looking at one kit that might be cheaper than another. That was his question from last month, and this was his question from this month, month which is the same thing, as well as a recommended memory for a 4790K. All right, let me see how well I can answer this question with some help from Crucial. Uh, they have a landing page about speed versus latency directly, and also addressing some of the misconceptions of this. So I'm gonna lean on this because Crucial, you know, they know what they're doing when it comes to memory. They're saying that the perception when it comes to latency is as uh, late as speed increases, latency or true latency, uh, which is usually measured in nanoseconds, goes up. This is a misconception though here on the left. The truth is that as speed increases, latency tends to remain the same. Uh, the true definition of latency and the calculation that they have here is true latency is uh, clock cycle time times the number of clock cycles there are. So fundamentally put here, memory speed is how long it takes memory to do, to, to do something. Memory latency is how long it takes to start doing that thing. Uh, if that's a simple way of putting it. They also have a chart here, which I thought found was fairly helpful because it compares different generations. So we have SDR, uh, uh, DDR, when they moved up to double data rate memory, and then we have DDR2, DDR3, and DDR4. The module speed is listed here, and uh, typical DDR3 speeds, uh, you know, a few years back were 1333, 1600, 1866. Typical DDR4 speeds, you'll see 2133, 2400, 2666. If you look at the clock cycle time in nanoseconds, and the big question mark on this chart is where they got this clock cycle time, but uh, we'll come back to that in a sec. If you multiply that by the cast latency, you will get the true latency of that particular kit of memory. Now, if you look here in the middle rankings, you'll find, for example, DDR3 1333 speed memory with a clock cycle time of 1.5 and a cast latency of nine, actually, was a little bit faster, 13.5 nanoseconds, than the ostensibly faster speed memory of 1600 and 1866, which actually had a little bit higher latency time, 13.75 and 13.93. Uh, the article does go on to address this specifically and uh, indicates, for example, the latency dipping down a bit, down to the 13 nanosecond range here, whereas it crept up a little bit if you look at some of the slower DDR4 speeds but then drops back down to about 13.5. If you're concerned about this, uh, bear in mind that from DDR3 1333 to DDR4 2666, modern memory span, true latency started at 13.5 nanoseconds, returned to 13.5 nanoseconds. There are several instances in this range where true latencies increased. The gains have been uh, frac by fractions of a nanosecond there, however. In the same span, speeds have increased by over 1300 megatransfers per, spec per second, which effectively offsets any trace latency game. So the uh, end answer here from Crucial, and I tend to agree with them, is that speed is the more important thing. Don't necessarily, not, don't necessarily look at cast latency and be like, oh, it says cast latency 14. I should definitely get that that over the cast latency 16 kit or something like that. Speed is going to be the first thing you look at. If speed is the same, then yes, a lower ca cast latency will mean a little bit faster memory. And now there is, of course, more to go on here because um, as we showed you this uh, calculation that you make and then also the clock cycle time, figuring out your clock cycle time is not necessarily the simplest thing. It is, again, a fairly simple calculation. And here's a video that you guys can watch by QLU about computer performance and relative performance CPU time clock time. But clock cycle time is uh, basically a value of one divided by your clock rate. And your clock rate, of course, can vary a lot depending on your CPU, your motherboard, your base clock speed, whether or not you're overclocking and different factors like that. Also bear in mind, when it comes to, uh, say you're looking at a modern CPU that has that runs at say four gigahertz, that's a pretty typical frequency. Four gigahertz is a simple number to look at, but um, if you calculate that to just straight hertz, that's four billion times a second. Four billion times a second. Computer's pretty fast. It's pretty crazy to think about actually right now. So if you look at what a nanosecond actually is, which is 1,000 millionth of a second, uh, or one over one, one billion, basically, uh, that's when it starts to get a little bit more confusing to calculate these numbers and figure out how many nanoseconds you're actually dealing with when it comes to the actual uh, clock cycle time of your computer. So if you can figure that out, then yes, you can go on to figure out your actual true latency of your memory. So maybe that's something that you guys could dive into. However, um, going that far is probably a little bit beyond what I get into for probing Paul. So hopefully that is giving you sort of a, 
a stepping off point for now. And finally, to finish off the other two questions, what's better, two by eight gigs or uh, four by four gigs, effectively? I would say go with two by eight gigs. The very, very marginal, marginal, minimal increase that you get by populating all of your DIMM slots is very much offset in my mind by the ability to just uh, upgrade and add more memory in the future. Finally, what memory for overclocking do you recommend for an i7 4790K and Z97 motherboard? Uh, I would say just try to find a memory kit that's around stable. It's 1866 or 2133. Those are higher frequency memory speeds for that platform, and uh, you're not going to get too much additional performance by going beyond that. Thank you for your question, Piotr. I hope I've answered it reasonably well. Moving along, we have a couple questions. Well, basically the same question asked by a couple people. So an Irish Asian, as well as Robert Bake asked, uh, how come you don't have an office yet that's not here at my house? Also, how does my wife handle the mess? This is a follow-up to some of the cleanup videos I did last month. Same question from Robert. Uh, am I thinking of getting an office like uh, Jay and Kyle have? Um, and yes, more, more, more veiled, veiled insults at my cleanliness and organization, organizational habits. Um, Main reason is that I don't feel like I need the office space at this time. I'm pretty confident that I have enough room here to do what I do and do it reasonably well. My main issue has just been building up the place to service my, my, my needs more functionally with storage for places for the things I need to put in storage and all that kind of stuff. Um, my wife and I both really like our house and we've worked on it a decent amount so far, but we have a lot of plans in the next year to do some more upgrades and that kind of thing. And I really, like, I, I don't know, I'm, I've always been fairly comfortable just treating this as my workspace, even though it's part of my house. Also, I get to do a bit of a tax write-off um, for having this as my workspace, so that doesn't hurt at all. And the additional expense of getting office space somewhere else has just never seemed like it would really work you know, the, the fee, work fee, be feasible for me financially, I guess. Um, and then uh, finally, I guess I would say I'm not completely opposed to the idea of getting an office or workspace somewhere else, but it's probably not going to happen this year. I might I might look into it again next year and see see how things are going for that. But for the time being, I like my garage. It it works for me. Next question from Jonas Svenningsen, uh, talking about FreeSync and G-Sync, adaptive uh, sync. Adaptive refresh rate is, is the generic term for that. Free sync and G-Sync are features that are becoming more and more a necessity than a nice to have these days. That is arguable, but uh, sure, it's necessary. Is smoother and stable frame rate, is a smoother and stable frame rate better than a high frame rate frame count or vice versa? And does free sync or G-Sync remove micro stutter from SLI or crossfire setups? Um, all right, so for your first question, smooth, stable frame rate, really high refresh rate. My personal opinion is smooth, stable frame rate. That's where I'm at. Now, there are certainly gamers who much pre much prefer high frame rate, and you're talking about 200 hertz or 244 hertz monitors with uh, any sort of V-Sync turned off, and they don't care about tearing because they just want to see what's going to be shown there as quick as possible, and that's totally legit. In my experience, I like the smoothness, so I do prefer plus 60, going above 60 hertz when it comes to the refresh rate of the monitor itself. I've been very spoiled by this guy back here, 100 hertz G-Sync, and I feel like if you can get up into the close to 100 hertz with G-Sync or FreeSync enabled, I think you'll have a really nice smooth gaming experience, uh, and you don't necessarily need to get up into the, say, 144 hertz or 200 uh, hertz frame rate as well. Also the benefit, if you're not as concerned about pushing really high frame rates, depending of course on the game you're playing and how difficult it is, is you might not necessarily need as crazy high of a, a graphics card. Like uh, you won't need the power to push all of those frames at the higher resolution. So that's something to consider too. I would say consider the smoothness first versus the high frame counts. Uh, and in my opinion, unless you're a competitive gamer and playing FPS games or something. The second question, does FreeSync or G-Sync remove micro stutter from SLI and Crossfire? It can help uh, marginally, but if your graphics card, if your computer is taking a second to output a frame, your monitor can't do anything to solve that. It's still going to be waiting on that frame. So it might insert frames in between, but it's just going to that, insert that same frame. So if you're having a micro stutter issue that's caused by an SLI or uh, crossfire configuration or a driver or something like that, um, it's not going to suddenly go away just by getting free sync or G-Sync. You're going to need to deal with that issue where it's being caused, which is often caused by driver issues. Sometimes uh, when you're dealing with multiple uh, graphics cards that can introduce more problems as well. 
Next question here from Eric Shen. Uh, he says he recently got a 1440p monitor. He's looking to get into 1440 gaming. Current CPU and GPU combo is an i3-6100, which is a dual core, uh, with a GTX 1063 gig. Can I get away with upgrading my GPU alone? Do you think I need a different CPU as well? If a different CPU is required, any suggestions? He's got a B150 motherboard, and he's uh, considering an upgrade path option if he wants to actually switch over from his entire platform and get a new motherboard and CPU. Now, Eric, I think you're actually in a pretty good position right now um, because your platform is not too old and you're kind of on in, in, the, in the area right now where there's good deals, um, brand new CPU deals for your platform uh, because it's not quite old enough. And actually right now with Black Friday, um, when it comes to LGA 1151, uh, the Z170 and Z270 equivalents, you have a more budget chipset, but um, still on that same platform when it comes to uh, your Skylake options. There's lots of choices there. So uh, KB Lake and Skylake, I would say consider a quad core upgrade for your CPU along with a GPU upgrade in order to give yourself the best 1440 gaming experience possible because you will start to see limitations with your dual core, of course, depending on what game that you play. But take a look at uh, Skylake and KB Lake upgrade options that you have that are compatible with your motherboard. Make sure you update your, update your motherboard's BIOS first and check your motherboard CPU support list to make sure that they updated for support for these. But like an i5-7400 uh, should slot in there pretty well. That would give you four cores and a pretty nice boost in CPU performance. Beyond that, you could even uh, think about something like an i7-7700. It's a little over $300, so a little bit more expensive, but that would give you four cores and eight threads. Don't bother with any of the K SKUs um, because you can't overclock with your motherboard anyway, but you can get a much better performing CPU to go along with what you're talking about as potentially a GPU upgrade as well. And uh, that's, that's kind of where I would go. You can do the GPU upgrade right now with your dual core and kind of see how things go. So that could be an option for you as well. You probably want the GPU upgrade regardless though, because three gigs on a GTX 1060 is probably not quite enough for your 1440 gameplay, uh, again, depending on the game that you're playing. Next question from Lone Wolf McCade. Can you please explain Intel Turbo Boost Technology 3.0 and is it required for overclocking? Uh, this is a good question for those of you who are familiar with it, but maybe you don't know exactly how it works. There's an Intel support page that sort of explains it. Uh, it's a driver coupled with information stored in the CPU. It identifies and directs workloads to the fastest core on the die first. That's your, that's your basic explanation from there, and there's a little bit more here on what's going do bear in mind, it's only going to uh, function with X99 and X299 based motherboards, so the high-end desktop stuff from Intel. And I can give you a quick demonstration of how it works because it's actually running on this system right now. You don't need it for overclocking. So if you're going to do manual overclocking uh, in the BIOS or that kind of thing, you don't, you don't need this. If you do basic Windows updates and you have a system that's compatible, in my experience, it will load this automatically, the Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0 little module here. Uh, and this is where you can actually go and like add applications and you can tie specific applications to uh, how many cores you want it to use and that kind of thing. So if you have an application that you know like only uses two, co two cores, then you can do that kind of thing with it. But really what this is doing is it's identifying the core on your CPU. And I have a 6950X in here, by the way, um, that is the fastest. And the core list that it's determined for me is the fastest is core number three. Intel did this so that they can compete um, with their high-end desktop CPUs a little bit better with um, mainstream CPUs that run at higher frequencies but don't necessarily have the same core and thread count. Um, if you look at Harbor Info 64 over here, and I apologize if this is kind of small, you might notice as I've been uh, streaming, well not streaming, but recording this video, um, my actual uh, clock speed's going on here. And you might notice that uh, if you look at the max, core number three right there is actually hitting four gigahertz. So that is essentially what Turbo Boost Max Technology 3.0 does. It identifies the core on your CPU that is the easiest to overclock, and it does it automatically for you. So when you're doing something that only requires a single thread or something like that, that core will run at a good four or 500 megahertz, at least in my experience right here, faster than all the other cores, which you're only maxing out at about 3.5. So that's basically what it is. And it's actually really easy to use and it's pretty effective in my experience. So um, I'm, I'm for it, I guess, <laughs> especially if you're not gonna be doing any manual overclocking, definitely make sure that that is loaded up because you will get some advantage from it. Awola21 asks, or says, cool lightsaber, dude, where did you get it? Uh, oh, do you mean this lightsaber?
I'm gonna break my monitor. Uh, all right, so this I was I was flaunting this uh, quite a bit last month because I got it for my Halloween costume and I used it in the video's thumbnail last month and stuff. So if you're wondering where I got it, it's a Force FX lightsaber. I bought it on Amazon, so I'll put a link to the description down there. There's actually several different variations of this. I bought mine for $150. $50. So a little bit on the expensive side for a accessory for a Halloween costume, but I got it because I knew it was kind of a showpiece type thing. Uh, this is the actual one that I got. It's the Darth, Darth Vader version, and uh, apparently it's on sale now. So if you want to save 30 bucks compared to what I bought it for, it's 120 uh, So that's kind of nice. And there's variations of, of the lightsabers, of course, different colors and everything. And like, if you want to be Luke Skywalker, you're fine. Or Darth Vader, 120. You're good. You're golden. Uh, oh, what? You want the the blue lightsaber? Well, that price jumps up to 225 My god, you wanted to be Mace Windu, Windu with, the, with the purple version? $900. Jeez. But hey, look, it's purple. It's the Mace Windu. It's got a different... Uh, different handle too. It probably uses different types, different kyber crystals. Uh, but anyway, all, there's a bunch of different variations on that and stuff here. They've even got the, uh, the Asajj Ventrest uh, one with the angled handle. That one's only $1,500. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. I'm glad I didn't invest in that one. But yeah, that, that's, that's where my lightsaber came from. But guys, that is all the questions that I've been asked for this month. Not all of them, but all the ones I decided to answer. Uh, of course, if you have questions for me for next month, leave those in the comment section down below. I'm going to get back to work on some video testing, uh, some computer testing of the computers I built and working on some more videos. So uh, again, hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, and I hope you guys are getting tons of awesome deals right now from the holiday savings that are going on for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll see you next time.